Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I was just starting seminary, my Aunt Dee, who had been suffering from cancer for many years, died. And I was overwhelmed with grief. I went to speak to the, the seminary pastor, but sadly, she was out of the office at that very moment. So I went home and decided to read my Bible. Not knowing exactly where to turn, I decided I would just simply set my Bible on its spine and let it flop open to wherever it flopped open and trusting that God would take care of the rest. Well, of course, wouldn't you know it, it flopped open to chapter one, verse one of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> a horribly depressing and even cynical book. <laughs> At first glance, this may seem to be somewhat unfortunate, but I, I laughed. In fact, I laughed so hard I cried. I laughed because in that moment, I recognized that God was with me. God recognized that life has its up days and its down days. There is a time to be born and a time to die time to weep, and a time to laugh. In other words, in that moment, I felt that God not only understood my pain and grief, but God also lifted much of their burden and comforted me as he told me what I needed to hear in conjunction with my faith in the God who raised Jesus from the dead. As a result, I found great wisdom about real life in the, in the pages and the words of Ecclesiastes. Perhaps it should come as no surprise then that the book of Ecclesiastes is part of the Bible that the Jews refer to as the wisdom literature, along with Job and Proverbs. Interestingly enough, they all have a very different perspective on life. Proverbs, with many of its words attributed to King's, wise King Solomon, has this optimistic high. I've got life figured out, so follow this wisdom and all of your life will just go well. Job, on the other hand, reflects a certain pessimism. The good suffer, the wicked prosper, and life is filled with great unfairness. Job rages against God, calling God to account, calling out for justice. Shockingly, though, Job ends with a rather kind of surprising, optimistic end, where God acts and justifies faithful Job. Ecclesiastes, however, is written from the perspective of a dying King Solomon, also reflects Job's pessimism. The good suffer, the wicked prosper. But then it goes on to add a sense of utter boredom. A been there, done that attitude to the extreme. There is nothing new under the sun, says the teacher. And it's a sad, sad business that God has given to humankind. <laughs> In many ways, the teacher was the first one to ask that existential question, what's the point? What's the meaning of life? It's all vanity. It's all meaningless. Ernest Hemingway, in his book, The Old Man and the Sea, tells the story of an old man as he struggles to fulfill his dream of bringing in that big catch, and he succeeds, only for it to be devoured by sharks on the way back to shore. There's nothing left. It was all meaningless. All that struggle was for naught. I imagine that Hemingway would agree with Ecclesiastes. All is vanity, a chasing after the wind. It's important to note that this existentialist despair arose not out of the gulags in Siberia or the, the concentration camps like Auschwitz, but in the glittering salons of Paris, the coffee houses of Copenhagen, and the luxury mansions of Beverly Hills prosperity. Ecclesiastes, you see, was written at the height of Israel's golden age, when people far and wide would come to see the wonder that is Israel. And maybe perhaps much the same way that people have come to see and experience the wonder that is the United States. At the same time, Ecclesiastes is written at a time of, well, of great dissatisfaction in Israel. The more people had, the worse they felt. They were falling into idolatry. Rather than worship God, the people pursued, uh, 
quality of life. And I think the same is true today. In our affluent Western civilization, we pursue quality of life and entertainment, endlessly browsing social media in, in a search for our next fix that, of something new and distracting, only to end up wanting more and more. There persists a gnawing sense of something is missing, a feeling of disconnectedness. I guess you could call it the curse of getting what you wanted. Ecclesiastes' observations hit home for me some years ago, especially in regards to my movie collection. When it was small, a mere 10 titles, I could watch them endlessly and with great enjoyment. But as, uh, at the same time, I looked forward to that day when I was going to be able to get my first real job and then I could go off and buy as many movies as I wanted. <laughs> However, when my collection reached, you know, between three and 400 titles, it could take me 45 minutes to pick one <laughs> because I couldn't really find what I was looking for. Not because I couldn't find a particular title, but because I couldn't find enjoyment. I could only watch a movie for 20 minutes before I found myself to be utterly bored out of my mind. My pursuit of quality of life it was all vanity. I reached out to take hold of it, and it proved to be nothing more than smoke, an illusion, a grand delusion. And I know that I'm not alone in this experience. So many work hard in life, looking forward to that certain quality of life called retirement. A time for grandchildren and a time for travel but discovered that their grandkids live far, far away and they spend more time traveling to doctor's appointments than anything else. <laughs> See, you, you, you know it too. Amen. <laughs> Their hopes fizzle in meaningless vanity. All is vanity. At the end of life, the teacher concluded that having followed every path to understanding the meaning of life except for one, he concluded that life ended in vanity, in the inevitability of a meaningless death. Or perhaps as Jesus once said, what does it profit anyone if they gain the whole world but then lose or forfeit their life, their true self? The path that the teacher hadn't followed was accepting that he was human and not God. The teacher didn't want to acknowledge his limits, to admit that life was beyond his wisdom, no matter how great that wisdom was as King Solomon, and his ability to comprehend life. He learned the hard way that to do otherwise is to take on God's burdens without having God's shoulders to support it. And that, that can only lead to despair. In many ways, that's exactly what my movie collection had become, a burden. When I gave away three-fourths of my collection, however, I discovered that much of my enjoyment returned. I could watch a whole movie and not get bored. As Jesus said, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, but being rich toward God. As such, Jesus did not pursue quality of life, nor the simple life, for both are forms of idolatry. Rather, Jesus pursued God by giving himself away, by being rich toward God and helping us bear our burdens. Or as Jesus put it, Come to me, all of you who are weary and are carrying a heavy burden. And I, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am humble and gentle of heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Whether I suffered under the burden of grief or the burden of despair or boredom, I have learned that Jesus' yoke is light and easy. At the, time, at the same time, his example of giving himself away is not something we take off when we retire. The yoke is removed from us only when we are carried out of here, feet first. Moreover, giving ourselves away does not mean that, that there won't be bad or difficult things that happen. There is a time to be born and a time to die, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, just as Jesus experienced in his own life. 
As the teacher learned the hard way, our treasures can't truly help us with the really hard questions in times of life because they cannot love us back. But with God who loves us first, at the center of our lives, then there is peace, faith, hope, and love to help us face and navigate the challenging and harsh, monotonous, and bewildering parts and times of life, a life that we cannot figure out all on our own. In the end, the teacher admonishes us all to remember our creator and to heed his commandments. Love God, your neighbor, and yourself. In so doing, we will find a purpose and a meaning to life, especially in a relationship to the one who, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, the one who is able to even bring meaning out of death. And this relationship is a secure foundation upon which to live life in all of its times and seasons. Amen. Amen.